thank you for getting me here. I'd like to uh, uh, in, uh, give you some a little bit of instructions for this uh, 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 lecture. You have set of green and set of red cards on your table. So whenever a uh, question comes, I will request from you to raise a green or raise a, a red card as appropriate. So the first, uh, um, I have to declare uh, any com no conflict of interest. However, I am working uh, as uh, evidence-based uh, medicine uh, tutor and trainer in and some positions uh, in several countries. And this is uh, on voluntary basis without any uh, money. So uh, how can we see the, oh, can I have to see that uh, slide. Can we see, I see the computer in front of me. Or maybe I'll just come down. So let's start with the first. Uh, red card means disagree. And the green card means agree. So taste of the, uh, taste the South event yesterday was perfect. No problem. Red card or green, uh, or green card? No, a single red. OK, this is what we call advocacy. Professor Hoffman was very generous, great hospitality. So we have to beat back somehow by advocacy. So let us challenge you a little bit. Inquiry. Barbecue in the zoo this evening should have more free drinks, red or green. <laughs> so yesterday was not perfect. There is something we need more. OK, another question. Barbecue in the zoo this evening should have more dancing. Uh, so you have some challenges here. But the vast majority green, I'm afraid. Barbecue in the zoo this evening should go more time till midnight. So what we have here now is some sort of inquiry. And the consensus basically is something between the balances between advocacy and inquiry. But at the end, a decision should be supported by everybody. So I'm afraid, Professor Hoffman, that you have to support more drinks, more dance, and more music. Midnight, there was some no consensus about that. When you say no, so I raise no, for example, for drinks, I don't drink. But however, I'm still supportive of the consensus, despite I have the right to say no. So speaking of to your values when you say no, and to support the group decision with trust, openness, and supportiveness. So in the ultrasound, we have similar situation where there are great discrepancies and great variability between various ultrasound practitioners or users in various domains, terminology, technology, teaching, a scope indication, diagnostic accuracy, diagnostic strategy, potential risks, cost effectiveness, health system aspects, and future research. In each one of these domains, people differ. In terminology, you find people use this, describe the same pathology by different terminology. And uh, to convey the message to the learners, the undergraduate, for example, you have to unify the terminology, otherwise you will get lost. Is it comet tail? Is it rocket sign? What exactly? Is it beeline? What exactly it is? So we need to unify this. The same for the technique. What exactly is the lung zones? Is it three zones? Is it six zones? Is it 28 zones? So you need to unify. So that sort of uh, standardization is uh, required particularly at the learner level. 
at the, uh, uh, those who are starting learning ultrasound. Otherwise, they will get so confused. The diagnostic accuracy, what exactly it means, what the likelihood ratio means, what is the positive and negative predictive values. Should I use that or use the likelihood ratio? Should I use that or use the post odds ratio? What is sequential testing is? So that sort of things which has a direct impact on the understanding of the tool in your hand has to be also standardized. And you go on on all these aspects. So there was a great demand of having such standardization to be done. So there are two types of guidelines, what's called consensus-based guidelines and evidence-based guidelines. And people think that uh, uh, any guideline is good. That's not true. You can have guidelines in your hand which is really doesn't worth the paper uh, wrote on. And to examine a guideline, there are some standards. One of the very good uh, report issued by the Institute of Medicine in 2011, the guidelines we can trust, the trusty, worthy guidelines. Eight standards should be fulfilled. However, in some aspects of guidelines, there, are no, there is no evidence, and you have to base your guidelines, like terminology, for example. It's a matter of agreement, and this is, can be exclusively based on opinion rather than based on evidence. The evidence-based guidelines basically has to be systematically structured and validated method for developing guidelines. This is a, a report which was released in uh, 2011 and considered as the Bible of how to, to do, develop guidelines, basically. The, oh my goodness, this uh, uh, also developing or assessing the evidence has to be standardized. So people should not vary in the level of evidence for the same thing. If they have the same uh, materials, same systematic review, for example, same randomized control trials, you should reach the same conclusion about the level of evidence. And the great system now, which is adopted by the WHO, by AHRQ, by the Cochrane, by all the leading healthcare uh, uh, bodies across the globe, is the one which probably uh, now uh, widely used and dominant in, each, in all guidelines, including WHO guidelines. So the great system, uh, just to summarize, it is a simple system, yet it is comprehensive. And uh, it is simple because, this is r r running quite fast, simple system because it divides the evidence into four categories only, uh, high, moderate, low, or very low. And the recommendations are only two categories, either strong or weak. So there is no 1A, 1B, 1C, 2A, 2B, 2C, and this you know, sub-classification which uh, developed in by Oxford Center of Evidence-Based Medicine, and nobody can understand it, nobody can have, it's counterintuitive, basically, because people cannot interpret it appropriately. So the great system now is the one which is required by uh, most of the organization. Ah. I'm, I'm scrolling the other way. So that is uh, how it is classified regarding the, uh, I have to point both ways, how to classify it regarding the level of evidence and how to classify regarding the grades of recommendation. And uh, whenever you are using evidence, use levels. Whenever you are using recommendations, use grades. Uh, one conflict of interest, probably, because I am also affiliated to McMaster, and McMaster who developed that, so I'm, I'm proponent for grade, but uh, again, no financial uh, conflict, maybe just intellectual conflict of interest. The uh, recommendations, if it's a strong recommendation based on high quality evidence, no problem with the risk harm, no problem with the risk cost, then this is a standard of care. If a weak recommendation, then potential variability is quite acceptable, and you should think twice before making as a standard of care. The, uh, it is simple, but it is comprehensive. It doesn't stop at the validity and the study design for assessing the evidence. It goes beyond that. Another seven factors for assessing quality of evidence. 
And uh, if you have strong evidence, that doesn't mean a strong recommendation. Strong evidence has to be incorporated in other factors transforming evidence to recommendation. So this is quickly how this uh, is uh, depicted by the uh, uh, grid system. You start with high, with high points at randomized control trial, and if it is observational studies, you low points. And then the risk of bias, which is validity, is the most important factor. However, there are other factors which can downgrade the randomized control trial, and there are other factors which can upgrade the observational studies. And at the end, you have a good judgment about the level of quality of evidence. And at the bottom of this screen, there are four factors. Those in the back probably you cannot see. The four factors basically is the outcome. Is the outcome is the surrogate outcome or final outcome? Is it patient-oriented outcome or disease-oriented outcome? And if the outcome is important or critical, you tend to make strong recommendation. If the outcome is less than that, then you tend to make weak recommendation. The second factor is the risk-benefit. So if there is harms and, uh, and uh, benefits, and they are close to each other, then you tend to make weak recommendation. If there are wider parts, the benefits overweighing the harm, then you tend to make strong recommendation. And benefit burden, and burden doesn't mean money only. Burden of the disease can be in the patient burden to take the medication or whatever, and the best uh, benefit burden also is a component which transforms the evidence into recommendation. And the finally, the preference in the values of the patient, whether, whether it is variable or not. So that means that you can have a strong evidence but weak recommendation because there are risks, there are costs. Or you can have weak evidence and a strong recommendation if it is life-threatening, if it is something like, for example, giving FFP for a patient who is bleeding due to INR. There is no randomized control for that, but it's life-threatening and big effect so you can really give a strong recommendation. That's quickly how it happens with the grade. So you have to judge both ways. You have to judge about the quality of evidence, and you have to judge about the importance of that evidence. And balancing between those, you have a judgment of overall recommendation. But the judgment has to be by the panel. And the panel are human beings, and they differ. And that's why you have to have consensus within evidence-based guidelines. So there are always a mandatory component of consensus. Uh, the 10 steps which you can uh, go quickly through them is how to do an evidence-based uh, clinical recommendation, the consensus statement. And as I said, there are always an area where there are, uh, the panel judgment is crucial and it needs consensus. So, the consensus brings the three Ps together, the practice, the people, and the policies together. There are eight methods for developing consensus. I would say most of them are dead, except the nominal group technique, the classical and the modified Delphi technique, and the RAND appropriateness method. Those are the three methods which are currently in use. Even NIH uh, consensus conference method, not really frequently used, but quite cumbersome. And despite that the RAND appropriate method was developed in US, but it is used in Europe more than US. So in the United States, you find a lot of uh, consensus meeting not following the RAND, but uh, uh, European community, as a matter of fact, uh, they adopted the RAND in their appropriateness methodology. So what is the, the RAND appropriateness method? This is, again, you heard about, you know, military, how it influences the medicine and ultrasound. It's not only the technology, but even the methodology. RAND Corporation, as you know, is background is military they developed that sort of consensus methodology to make it structured, calibrated, measurable way to measure the consensus and to resolve the disagreement. And uh, they developed it long time ago, and uh, uh, the, the Delphi technique and the RAND. And then went on to many modification from being uh, uh, just a questionnaire to be, uh, to be modified Delphi technique with face-to-face -face interaction, with real-time, there is e-electronic form as well. 
In the RAND with the UCLA, they developed the appropriateness criteria and the appropriateness method where the panel has to vote on a scale about the appropriateness and then there is a very meticulous, I would say, complex statistical method to measure accurately what is the agreement and disagreement and what is the degree of agreement as well. And that happens after minimum two rounds, but tell you, some reports went up to 250 rounds uh, uh, till they managed to get a consensus. Two rounds is a minimum, usually it takes from two to four through dialogue and discussion. And there is a difference between dialogue and discussion. So dialogue and discussion related to, uh, related to what's called creative and emotional tension. When everybody's happy with Professor Hoffman, then everybody voted for perfect event. And this is advocacy prevails. But some people may have influence and power and may have personal issues, and they may contradict that. And then tension emerges in an unhealthy way. And at the end, you find there are losers or there are winners. And the emotional tension really trying to find a clear-cut answer to fix the problem. In the creative type of tension is contrary to that. People trying to make some sort of inquiries and challenges. And those are challenges to be transformed within the group. So the idea just spread over the group till they reach either a compromise or either they are convinced. So there is some sort of transformational rather than transactional type of uh, end product. And this is quite really interesting because uh, without creative tension, the panel wouldn't really got, get to the point. So you need some provocative uh, individual who challenge the ideas and they make a lot of inquiries and get them towards thinking twice about what they are doing and whether this is the best or not. And tell you, in the uh, several meetings which we held for the international uh, uh, guidelines for ultrasound, we had a lot of uh, emotional tension. Uh, but fortunately enough, we had a couple of individuals like Dr. V, Vicky Nobel, who came with, you know, the charming smile. Everybody's comfortable with her. And then she started to challenge all the content of the statement. And uh, at the end, most of the uh, panel convinced that probably we have to make a drastic change in that statement based on that. So to have somebody who can really create that creative tension, provocative type of questions, uh, inquiries, challenges, is very essential for panel management. But when you have, I didn't put, by the way, the Dr. X. We had many, multiple Dr. Xs. Most of them are males, as a matter of fact, not females. And uh, famous people. People built the repetition and uh, history on discovering signs. They have signs by their name. They are so focused to their you know, uh, own experience. They don't tolerate any changes. And at the end, by when we, OK, let's see whether that is good for the end user of guidelines to name it as you name it in 20 years ago or not, then transformation occur. And people tend to, OK, let us forget about this history and recreate it and go towards the benefit of the end user. And that's how the guideline uh, performance should go for the consensus. Quite challenging. I remember. Dr. Mike Blavius make a time out once, like the basketball, to stop the tension. The emotional tension came between two big guys in Europe uh, in, in the lung ultrasound. Quite hectic discussion. You know, uh, Mediterranean is not like here, so people get, you know, walk, uh, talking with hands and uh, voice loud and whatever. It's not as uh, North America usually. Anyway, so 
you need some sort of tension, you need some sort of inquiry, you need some sort of challenges for the guide, guideline committee. And at the end, you have to resolve the disagreement in most of the condition if you make transformation uh, across the panel. And if there is some consensus, you have to measure the degree of the consensus. So consensus development and consensus measurement. And the way which you do it, they make a scale from one to nine. One to three usually is against. Four to six is uncertain. And seven to nine is with. And then through statistical methodology, if there is more than, you get the median score. And if there are people outside the median, too much people are outside the median region, then there is disagreement. So 30% is the cut point usually is used. However, in some of the crucial guidelines which can affect patient life, probably you need different threshold for disagreement. So that is something which you have to set up at the start, what is the threshold of disagreement. Uh, but uh, nobody's using 51 against 49. So simple majority doesn't work in guidelines. It has to be absolute majority. Five minutes more. So uh, I think I just run quickly. At the end, you have what is weak ways and weak against, or strong ways or strong against. So you have uh, the product is quite easy at the end. You have strong recommendation, ways or against, weak recommendation, ways or against. And the cascade for uh, developing such uh, weak or strong recommendation looks complex, but it is with a brief set of rules, uh, uh, the computer will generate it quite easily. Uh, there are some challenges in that. Not all the panel are in the same uh, um, experience. So you can adjust for authority coefficient. You can adjust for the importance of factors uh, by another coefficient. And you can adjust for uh, uh, coefficient of concordance regarding uh, consensus as well. Uh, the wording should be crystal clear. So when there is a strong recommendation, we recommend. When there is a weak recommendation, we suggest. So the end user will not get confused with that. Arta South guidelines, uh, we made great improvement or great uh, achievements in the lung, five domains already done, in the vascular, five domains already done, in the echo, 10 domains are being done, and uh, I'm expecting probably a month from now, probably you will find some products published. Trauma just started just the initial launching phase which started, so still a long way to go. And medical education, I'm, I'm not sure when Professor Hoffman will do it, but it is uh, definitely um, in his agenda, I hope. Uh, the key ingredients here among the development consensus, trust, openness, and supportiveness. If that is occurring between the panel and the start challenging their ideas with open, openingly, they will reach the conclusion. I will conclude my slides by this slide, which is talking about the board of the panel and boards of the parallel. So board of the parallel, the shortest what determines really what is the barrel will contain. Not only that, the, how tight the boards are will also determine how the barrel will contain. Thank you so much.